Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for Transfiguration of Our Lord on February 27th, 2022 our Exodus 34, 29 through 35, Psalm 99, 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 4, 2, and Luke 9, 28 through 36, or you can continue, you can continue on to verse 43. So happy transfiguration to the two of you. Happy transfiguration to Joy J. Moore, who's taken a little bit of time away to be Dean. And what is a good transfiguration transfiguration gift? Happy transfiguration to all of our listeners. Exactly. Flashlight. Lent is upon you. A flashlight is a great gift (laughs) for this. Because you can never find a flashlight. Yeah, but you have yeah, but you have one on your phone. I was wondering about this the other day. Yeah. Like how many if flashlight purchases have diminished, declined. Yeah, but you need the big mag light. Mm. Okay. For transfiguration, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe multiple ones. So Luke's version, of course, like anything else in Luke, is is kind of fun with its own peculiarities. The focus on prayer that this is taking place, just like the uh, the choosing of the 12 and just like the baptism is, is in the context of, of prayer. You've got this reference to the Exodus, which is lovely, especially in a gospel that has... Um, already talked about liberation and um and jesus has described himself as one who will set people free and so something a little 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 more the moses volume is turned up a little bit louder maybe with that uh, as well Uh, and then just i think some of the the things that sarah henrik talks about regarding uh regarding sight and seeing which we've talked about this is an important verb or important sense in luke's gospel not just for thinking about faith but for coming to grips with or coming to grasp who Jesus is. So where do you drop down? We often talk about how this is a difficult Sunday because there's always a temptation to explain the transfiguration. I think it's better to just dwell in it or experience it and be even a little confused or enticed by it as opposed to trying to understand it. I don't think anybody really does understand what in the world is going on here, but there's Enough raw material to make a great sermon out of it all. Yeah, I think you you named uh, three of the key themes of this passage, and uh, you mean the and three like, things you wanted to say. Were they the three things I wanted to say? Did I anticipate what's on your list? Uh, well, Sarah Henrik did uh, okay. pretty much <laughs> her commentary, <laughs> but but she yeah she points out I think uh, and again uh, this is you know this is. When, when we think of the location of this passage, of course, uh, right before Lent, and then we move into different aspects of, of Luke uh, and in Lent, and then we'll pick up Luke, uh, come back to chapter eight later on after Easter. But, but, you, but we're naming some really key things here of Luke. And I, I think one of, the, one of the aspects of preaching a Sunday like this that we've talked about for years and years and years now is not, not necessarily to preach about the day uh, or the festival uh, and, and try to explain it, but the way in which the text 
uh, and the particularities, the specificities of the text lend lend to a kind of preaching the experience or uh, having or having not a better understanding of the transfiguration, but what 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 it might mean. And so those distinctive characteristics of this passage are then critical to uh, to how we might think about what transfiguration means here and now uh, at, on this Sunday and according to Luke. And so you have the, the emphasis on prayer, which we've already seen. And the fact that while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. I'm not sure that you in a sermon want to say, okay, this can happen to you, you know, try this at home. This could happen to you too. Uh, when you pray that you're going to be <laughs> transfigured, but, uh, but there is something there. It, it's it, that, uh, that, that, uh, how do I want to say this? That they're locating it in prayer is really interesting to me. Uh, that what do we expect in prayer, or why is it that we pray, or uh, what experiences do we have when we pray? What's revealed to us when we pray? How are we changed when we pray? Uh, it could be a one one way. You know, we talked about Matt drop into this passage uh, is. And then you, of course, got the departure, which the, which the commentary points out that they appeared in glory and we're speaking of his exodus. And so those liberating themes of Luke and then the invitation to see and to sight and perspective. Yeah. So those three themes, but I'm not sure where I would drop down, except yeah. I thought the praying thing was really interesting. Well, I also love, uh, I always learn things from Sarah Henrik and, yeah. and, and always have the the reference to the ex, the exodus isn't easy it's a it's a sign there that that it's also a reminder of plagues blood the death of firstborn sons and the unremitting recalcitrance of the oppressive power of the egyptians uh she can write and she sees that that so when we see that word exodus and if we want to make some homiletical hey out of that to remember too that this is even the transfiguration there's this Oh, what's the word? Foreboding feeling about that, or a sense that it's not easy. Nobody's ever liberated without a fight, or without, without consequences. Somebody being, yeah, or without. Consequences. I mean, she points that out right in Exodus, an exodus from under the power of any oppressor has a cost, and and then Jesus sets his face like flint to get to go to Jerusalem in nine fifty one, and so. Uh, that uh, I think that's an important aspect of, of if, if this is where you drop down, right, of recognizing that uh, that the transfiguration uh, means and that liber and that liberation means a certain um, there are certain responsibilities of how that freedom then gets and that liberation gets lived out. What do, you, uh, what, what do you guys make in uh, Luke about the uh, the three dwellings, uh, which I assume uh, based on, well, let me just ask, what do you make of that? Is it is that a reference uh, to uh, Sukkot uh, and and perhaps to the to, the, to that festival? Because isn't it the same word that? Uh, occurs or I have to look uh, it up I assume it's Skene yeah I was just looking that up right now uh and it is yep three Skenes Skenas tres Skenas yes three three dwellings Skenao is the uh, of course the um verb and so another place that's used oh <laughs> the verb <laughs> Yes. So oh, that was just a, that was a withering just, laugh. I was just a withering like, oh, you're so funny. John one fourteen, <laughs> and then in, so and in, then of course in uh, uh, in Revelation dwelling. But so I think there is something verse, there. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So in verse thirty one, like you said, uh, the departure is uh, Exodus, and then dwelling Sukkot. While well, that that's about. Uh, right, that's about commemorating the um, time in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I, I think I, I stopped short of saying this is definitely a reference to Sukkot or something like that, just because the 
the interpretive history of, of the transfiguration stories has been so like Moses and Elijah must represent the law and the prophets. There's like, no, Moses and Elijah represent two eschatological figures that uh, according to Jewish tradition had a role to play still in the end of, of, of days. Um, no, Moses and Elijah are the two grandest prophets in Israel, Israel's history. I mean, there's been a lot of all or nothing in terms of how to interpret what they stand for and how to interpret mm -hmm. Peter's desire to stay on the mountain, whether this is like a bad idea that says Peter wanting to stay on retreat and not go back to the hard. I, I just, it certainly is a mix, right? There's whatever's going on, the, well, the, I was going to say the author, whatever is going on in the tradition, it's ringing a ton of bells that are all mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. pay attention to this guy. Uh, all of the hopes, <laughs> well, I'll do this. Uh, the hopes and fears of all the years, right, are, are found um, in Jesus in some way, shape, or form that this is in no way a departure from Old Testament promise. These are all coming together. So I, my interpretation of this always kind of comes down to like, let's just enjoy the fact that Luke or Jesus has just dumped a whole lot of meaning on the table for us here mm -hmm. and invite us to make some connections without insisting it's got to follow one, one line, which you weren't saying, of course, Rolf, but no. that's the only reason why I want to pull back and not say definitively, this is some kind of reference to the booths. I mean, it, it is in some way, shape, or form, right? This is what you do. It's a, it's a hospitality gesture as well. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just kind of my these rant. Aren't three, the uh, these aren't three booths set up at the state fair to uh, sell. <laughs> Nor is it about the Trinity. No, it's not about, but there, yeah, there is something clearly going on there uh, with, you know, with reference to Skenes and Booths and, and, um, and how is it that, oh, it, you know, it, I mean, we, we've talked about this before in years past with the transfiguration and you were alluding to that, Matt, too, that, that sense of, uh, that sense of how, how do you, how to contain the, how do you contain the temporal or how do you contain the, you know, finite or, or the desire to do so, uh, you know, the, the, but at the same time, the promise of, you know, the promise of booths and the wandering in the wilderness is the promise of God's presence in the midst of that. Um, and that the, and that the booth was, uh, I mean, the, the tent was, uh, was a temporary, <laughs> A, a temporary reality of of keeping God, um, keeping God there, and God's presence there. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that helps us very much, but uh, but there's definitely something that's 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 calling attention to, uh, or it's calling attention to the way in which I mean, going back to the Exodus, because what happens after the Exodus? Well, what happens to the Israelites? They're wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think I think there's a direct, I think there's a connection there that that exodus, that exodus leads to um, a, a sort of sense of transient, you know, a transitoriness. Um, and uh, that maybe one could explore in a sermon as well. Yeah, which uh, at least some of the prophets look back on the uh, wilderness, the story of the wilderness uh, with fondness as the time when um, Israel was learning to uh, follow um, the Lord. And so um, there's some of that, too. And Finally, there's the reference probably to Psalm 2 in verse 35. So you get, you know, you get some reference uh, to uh, this is my son at the beginning of his published ministry, uh, you know, at the baptism. And then here uh, at the transfiguration, right when turning and then setting his face towards Jerusalem. So many things. Uh, well, different, and, uh, and, aspects. and the location of the transfiguration is that as that bridge Sunday between Epiphany and Lent. Right. So the way in which we've moved into one of your favorite themes for Lent, uh, Rolf, of the Lenten journey. So actually, we, in the year of Luke. I actually appreciate it just as long as you remember, we are not going on a journey. Jesus yeah. is. Jesus and it's going, going to end. Journey. It's going yeah. to end. Uh, it's going to end with him on another mountain, not lit up uh, 
like the Vegas Strip, but in darkness and dead. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. what, one quick thing, what catches my eye this year is in verse 36, where, the, where Peter, James, and John keep silent in those days and told no one of any of the things they had seen. Which in some ways, you know, the, the form critic in me says, oh, this is a way of talking about how everybody was surprised by the crucifixion and resurrection that, you know, the disciples were, didn't really talk about everything that they knew. And only after they got together did they realize what was going on. I, but I don't want to preach on that. But it's this idea of being so stunned and so overwhelmed by this, which is, I don't know, it just, it's, they saw his glory is what it says as well, right? They, I mean, it's not like they're seeing all of this in some opaque way. They don't, but they don't fully understand what's going on and they're so struck by it or it seems so either so wonderful, so terrifying or so weird. The text doesn't tell us that they just keep silent, which I don't think is necessarily a condemn, a criticism of them. Mm -mm. it's just what happens sometimes in these encounters with the holy and in my own life i i never trust my theological claims on the spur of the moment i i need a good decade or two to be able to look back and and say i think what happened back then was this <laughs> yeah maybe i'm just slow. In hind That's... hindsight right hindsight is yeah and well and, and some of those moments then that were incredibly formative in my own spiritual life have probably taken on an outsized significance because i remember them now in a certain way but there's something to be said here about contemplation, I guess, is what I'm saying, or about taking your time. Well, I, and I, I, I think that's a, a really important verse, and I'm glad you lifted that up in that, you know, that the response is they kept silent uh, and told no one of any, any of the things they had seen. And the question is, what do they see? But they also hear, uh, they hear a declaration from the heavens that that was only for Jesus and Luke, you know, that's the difference between uh, the baptism declaration, it's you are my beloved son. And, uh, and then now we have the uh, demonstrative pronoun this. And so they're hearing- way to, drop your, way to drop your grammar terms on us. Oh, thank you. I love grammar, grammar is awesome. So demonstrative pronoun, this. So that's also, uh, that's part of the response as well. It's the vision of the glory, but actually hearing the affirmation of from the heavens of Jesus' identity, which we should we should be remember that Jesus has just asked them, "Who do you say that I am?" Back in uh, verses eighteen uh, through twenty, and then Peter says, "The Messiah of God." And then you get to the transfiguration where the heavens basically say the same thing that he just said. And so I think there's something there too. It's like, wait, what? I was right. Like, uh, I mean, I, I just, you know, Messiah of God, I think that was the right answer, but now the heavens are confirming that who I think this is, is, is who it is. And that would be a cause for silence for me. <laughs> <laughs> that I actually got the answer right. And like, and then wait a minute, what does that mean? What does that mean that what we are recognizing about who Jesus is, is now affirmed from the heavens? And yeah, that, that would, that would probably make me silent as well. <laughs> let's, let's just admit, there's not many things that make the three of us shut up. <laughs> Exactly. There you go. But we're still going to talk more about Exodus. So we spent a good amount of time on the gospel text because it's, after all, Transfiguration Sunday. Yeah. But now we've got shiny, shiny Moses. It is, this is of the weird stories in the Old Testament. This is top five weird for me. Uh, and I don't, I don't really think it has a preachable, I mean, you can, you can find a way to wrestle you know, something out of anything, I guess. Uh, but this, I guess, just mostly helps inform uh, the transfiguration story that you've got something like it. Uh, so Moses is there uh, in the transfiguration story, I think mostly because he is one of the eschatolog eschatological figures. Uh, here, uh, 
it's you've got this similar story that Moses goes up a mountain and that uh, his face is transfigured, um, so to speak, and he has to wear a veil uh, when he comes back down. Um, I don't really know what else to uh, do other than tell the story and let it kind of uh, resonate back and forth with the transfiguration story. Well, I think that's true with the other passages as well. I mean, I'm not sure that me personally, if I were preaching on Transfiguration Sunday, would uh, uh, have the other passages be the central text. I would, you know, focus on the Transfiguration, and clearly the other passages are in support of that. But there's language from each one, uh, uh, or there are themes from each one that I think can underscore the the what we were talking about earlier in the podcast of the experience of the Transfiguration. The, the, the experience of being in the holy, in, in, in the midst and of the holy. And what does that, how would you describe that? How would that, what would that be like? And, uh, and so you've got, you know, you've you got similar things going on with the second Corinthians, but particularly the Psalm, right? That uh, the Lord is King, let peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, you know, that, how is it that, what would be your response to, would it be trembling? Would it be silence? Would it be, I think maybe that's the way you could use the other passages to, to, to create that sense of awe. Yeah, you can't expect to encounter this God and not be changed um, or to encounter, yeah. to glimpse on the glory of God and not be changed. And this is obviously a weird way of describing that, like Rolf said, but yeah. what other ways does that happen? Isn't this the passage where the tradition of Moses having horns comes from? Yes. Horns? And it'll preach. Well, it this is this is um it <laughs> Sorry, that could be uh, yes. a 10 minute detour, I realize we can <laughs> Yeah. That you almost got you almost as, as I always tell my students, it's your job to try to get me off track. And it's very easy to do uh, with me, <laughs> you know. Uh, but so yeah, the the imagery of uh, of of the um, <laughs> I'm thinking in Hebrew, Koran, originally Karnu, Akkadian Karinu, something like that. The uh, you you do find it in the iconography of Mesopotamian gods, these horns, and so uh, the idea that in some way, and here's Band at the podcast making a visit. Uh, that's uh, um. You know, he um, wanted to see the new video setup, and he wanted to make his presence known uh, for those of you who are watching this online. But uh, yeah, so it's it. I do like. I mean, that is a really helpful thing that uh, there's some effect on us. You can't encounter the divine, and the divine has uh, the difference. I suppose that the transfigure really sh the transfiguration really shows the incarnation. Uh, so that uh, with Moses, God is in heaven and uh, meets Moses on the mountain. And so Mo Moses has this sort of residual glow, uh, whereas in Jesus now, the incarnation. So uh, on earth, Jesus uh, himself is the one that's transfigured. Um, Psalm 99. Uh, so I've got the, the commentary on the website. Um, one of the things that I discovered about the psalm as I was looking at it that was so... Um, I hadn't noticed before is all these uh, all these really short uh, epithets. Is that how you pronounce that epithet uh, for for God almost? So you know it says, "Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is He, mighty King, lover of justice, the one who's established equity." You know, th there's these really short staccato um, titles for God, uh, and they they really stand out for me as ways of praising God. Um, and more broadly, um, the I suppose the difference, the, the odd, the oddness of the pairing is that this is a song that does actually calls for worship on the mountain. So worship on the holy mountain, um, which I don't know if that resonates well with the transfiguration story or poorly. What do you think? I think it works. Yeah. I think it's fine. I'm not sure there's anything wrong with Peter saying, hey, let's build some tents up here. I mean, I don't think he knew what was going on, but 
I don't think it's necessarily a lack of faith on his part, but that's back to the gospel. If you think that the Exodus story about Moses having to wear a veil was weird, wait till you read what Paul does with it. (laughs) It doesn't get any less weird. I mean, he he transforms Uh it, ta-da, transfigures it by by using that story as a kind of metaphor for ignorance. But he's also playing around here with themes of of hope and glory too. And, And part of what he's getting at is that his ministry and Timothy's ministry, this this true apostolic ministry is really all about hope and glory, but it happens in this weird sort of way. It happens through shipwrecks and beatings and all of these other things. So he's trying to hold together a variety of themes here, but in this case, talking about ways in which, you know, if you imagine what the old covenant was able to do, imagine how great the new covenant is going to be. I mean, it's one of Paul's favorite ways of arguing, but But there is a kind of, I think, embedded in here, a way of saying, how do we encounter this this glory of God? And we encounter it through ministry of uh, of Christ, Uh, Paul's ministry of Christ, which again, isn't in this passage, but you'll see it in other places, uh, which is not one of of success and wealth and, and acclaim, but a much more difficult one. So how that fits on this day, I'm not exactly sure, but if you're the kind of person who wants to get all four texts mentioned into your sermon. Um, We'll talk a bit about how this idea of glory uh, continues on even in the ministry of the church. Redefined 